he says to me is our participation in the natural and divine law. This view he contrasts with the new. The new is a mere child of late modernity. While the old grew out of the sturdy conviction that we are children of God, the new is a result of man's cosmic homelessness. While the old affirms the gift of the divine spark, that we are free and therefore responsible, the new asserts merely that we are merely free. Where the first calls men and women to a personal response to an objective moral order, the second is an evening he calls counterfeit that steals prestige from the old anthropology, but in the end is no more than the assertion, as he says, of self-will. And in a godless secular culture that has forgotten its roots, the liberty of conscience will sooner or later decay into a simple license. Now by contrast, a new view conscience is rather like any other faculty. To function well, it has to strive towards its aim, the thing that it is suited for, just like the eye is suited for light. It needs exercise to become excellent. Our memory is like this, isn't it? If you want to teach a child the multiplication table, there's really no quick way of getting around it. You simply have to practice. If you want to be proficient at the piano, you simply have to play your scales every day. Conscience is like that. If we are to acquire a habit for making right judgments about practical moral questions, we need something of the precision of the mathematician joined to the feeling of the musician. Or to say this in other terms, in Newman's view, conscience is not an oracle. Conscience is an organ. Conscience doesn't create moral truths. It allows us to respond to them. One of the dangers inherent with trying to protect conscience today without properly defining and grounding our terms is that we might end up protecting something not really worth keeping. In any case, those who profoundly, lovingly, and wholeheartedly exercise this, our natural orientation toward the good, who refine their God-given capacity to know the true and the beautiful, Catholic tradition reserves a special name. Do you know what it is? We call them saints, of course. To learn what a properly functioning conscience looks like, we need, we need good rules, yes, fine, but even more, we need good models. Men and women who have become excellent at the work of the virtuous life. And the church's history, thanks be to God, is filled to the brim with such models. Fast forward now about a half century from Newman up until the, uh, the time of the Second World War. And I don't know if you prepared it all for this conference. I already mentioned that we asked our presenters to a little bit beyond what they were hardly going to do. But for myself, I knew the thing was, I knew the state was coming, so I, I switched my evening reading uh, to other topics. I was reading around the Second World War and some of the gruesome uh, thinking and acting that surrounded the, the Nazi regime and, and work of the Soviets. Well, this moment, that is to say, 50 years after the moment, one Father Maximilian Kolbe enters onto history's stage. Even prior to the war, Kolbe's life and training as a Franciscan priest had been one long discipleship that cultivated in him a pure and loving and responsive conscience, a conscience that was ordered to the love of God and his neighbor. So, when he was made prisoner at the death camp at Auschwitz, that training was severely tested, and it was found true. You probably know the story. When a Nazi soldier told a married man who was to be executed, that man pleaded in prison for mercy, crying out, I have kids, I have a wife. And upon hearing this, Maximilian Kolbe raised his hand, said, let me take his place. And oddly enough, the Nazi officer allowed him to do this. 
Colby took the nun's place with some others and spent the next 14 days or so in his starvation bunker. Why did he do it? <coughs> well, Colby didn't volunteer because he had to. There was no gun, so to speak, that forced his hand. There's no rule that requires he do such things. His was simply a free decision for the good for which his many priestly sacrifices had prepared him. And so 14 days later, when the Nazi nurse stepped into the bunker to finally euthanize Colby by lethal injection, he saw something strange in this priest's face. Even at that horrific moment, when he looked into the eyes of this dying man who had given his life for another, he still saw love. Not all the acid of the cynics, not all the guns of the tyrants could snuff out the spark that burned brightly in this witness to truth, a witness that still shines for us. About the same time, during the end of the Second World War, people were already beginning, beginning to ask how the West would rebuild after the nightmares of the camps. In 1943, leaders of the French resistance asked a Jewish philosopher, Simone Weil, to prepare a plan for the future renewal of French society. Surveying the collapse of moral order, Guy proposed that what the West needed was to recover again its roots. It had abandoned its best traditions for the mere law of the jungle, she thought. Having roots, she wrote, was, quote, perhaps the most important and least recognized need of the human soul. And so as a result, uprootedness, she said, is the deadly malady to which modern secular societies have become exposed. Have we? The swift collapse of France only made manifest a kind of root rot that had long ago afflicted the country. It's hard. It's hard to rebuild. It's hard to cultivate. Standing up those who say morals are relative, that requires courage. Standing up to those who admit us tell lies about our bodies, that requires courage. Standing up to those who kill the innocent, that too requires courage. To stand firm, we need roots. After the war, the West did make a vigorous effort to recall its roots. Freedom of religion and of conscience were universally defended by us Western liberal democracies and enshrined in aspiring declarations. And you know about them. Such freedoms, it was argued, form the pre-political goods that make democracies worth fighting for in the first place. Marriage, religion, property, conscience, the sanctity of life. These are goods the state confers the state has no power to arbitrarily define such things any more than it can define gravity. That's the business of tyrannies. That's what happens to people who are subject to a dictatorship of relativism. No, these are goods the state is called to protect, as indeed our charter does. For liberal democracies, fundamental rights can't be begotten ex nihilo. They are, as our charter wisely puts it in the preamble, both founded on God and on the rule of law. Well, as we know, that broad consensus has begun to crack. Today, in the hyper-secular, atomized, postmodern West, with the loss of confidence in truth, in the moral order, conscience does seem hard to define, and for some, hardly even worth defending. For many, indeed, the rights of conscience get in the way of the march of so-called progress, which is merely the progress, human might say, of an ever-expanding self-will. Ladies and gentlemen, if we were to ask Cardinal Lumen what we need to defend the rights and duties of conscience today, I think he would suggest to us that we need clarity, that we need roots, and that we need courage. Just before I call the first speaker, I do want to invite you for coming. 
it's a great privilege to have have you here, and it's a great honor that we all share in being able, being able to spend time devoting our thoughts to such worthy topics. So I invite you, as we begin, to rise with me as we offer our reflections and our work to God in the words that Jesus taught his disciples. <clears throat> 